Good morning. Good morning. Let me pray for my voice to hold up. Because it's starting to be bad. We've got a long week to go. Um, we are in Leviticus 18. We're finishing up 18. Uh, hitting 19. And if we go past 19, we're flying by the seat of our pants because that's all I prepped for. It's, it's <laughs> I looked at it, Jack. I looked at it after last Wednesday's how fiasco. Long, Come on. All I saw was one light on this how, side. How long have you been around Jack? <laughs> Longer than me. Uh, and you know he can't help it. No, but but we had a we had a snafu on Wednesday. We did. We had a snafu. Um which probably was the snafu on Tuesday. Yeah. Would be my guess. Yeah. On that. Probably would have just hit the button. Exactly. So, uh, we are in Holy Week. Again, I remind you all, remind you online, we will not meet next week. You're more than welcome to come, uh, but I'm not going to be teaching anything. Because um, at that point, then I know my voice will be gone. Um, so, um, we, we will finish up the uh, the study on uh, the unlawful sexual relations today, but then the next section is very inter the next section. If you recall last week, I, I I mentioned about you know the 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 letter to the the Gentiles about the things to prohibit, mm -hmm. and and we've been tracking these, and then the next section will really hits. You know the whole thing about false idols, following false idols. So I can see where that X um, letter, uh, why it was written, because of how God established these things for the uh, the Jewish people, uh, and and the Jewish people knew that they were very significant for um, maintaining proper relationship with God, but more importantly, where in that proper relationship where God can can give can pour out his holiness upon the people so uh, that's where we will be looking at today so let's bow our heads most gracious heavenly father we give you thanks again as we gather together to be in the word we just pray for uh, your guidance your spirit to, to help us to see uh, how this applies to us because too often people want to throw these things out and say it doesn't it no longer applies but indeed it does because again your desires to uh, pour out your holiness upon your people. So guide us and lead us in, in, in the correct understanding and application for our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay, last week we spent the first part of, uh, well, the, the first half of 18 talked about, you know, just that sense of uh, not uncovering the nakedness. Part of that is, you know, not having the sexual relationships, but it's, it's also just, you know, the even uncovering the nakedness, uh, exposing the nakedness um, is improper. Um, and I cited statistics about pornography um, in, in, our, in our world today, but even in the church today, how rampant that is. Um, but the one thing I did not mention about this chapter, uh, you know, these are the things that disrupt relationships. Uh, we will, you know, we, we saw that big chunk last week and we will see some other ones this week, but it really is go back to Genesis chapter two, Genesis chapter two. What did God say about relationships? Now I'm causing you to have to really dig. <laughs> Do I know Genesis chapter two? If I don't, I got to turn back to it. He gave us a helper, not multiple helpers. But, but that, that's part of it. But what did he say prior to that? Man should not be alone. It is not good for man to be alone. So, so he establishes relationships. Now, Jack, <laughs> you know, now he says, this is the way it looks. And, and, and really, 
and, and I hope I said this last week. If I didn't say that this last week, I'm saying it now is these are the extensions of that relationship. So daughter, son, aunt, uncle, grandparents. That's the extension of that relationship uh, as we see that played out. And, and so, you know, he's really saying, and again, um, and, and, and we see that socially today. You know, when a divorce happens in a family, who does it affect? Yeah, there's a there's a a far extending effect on that, and so we see that borne out with what he's saying in, in this first part. So we get to the second half of the chapter. Uh, we, we will be picking up at verse nineteen, and somebody read nineteen to twenty three. Shall not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness while she is in her menstrual unclean. And you shall not lie sexually with your neighbor's wife. So make yourself unclean, and so make yourself unclean with her. You shall not give any of your children to offer them to Moloch, and to and so profane the name of your God. I am your Lord. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And you shall not lie with any animal, so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is a perversion. Okay. And we live in our world today. And, and the first part of it, you know, we, 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 we were introduced to that in the last chapter about, you know, sexual relations while a woman is in, in her menstrual cycle. You know, again, that, that, you know, renders uh, someone unclean, but, but, you know, again, we get the provisions in the last chapter for that. Um, uh, and, and then again, the, um, the moving forward. Interesting thing about the, um, does it seem odd that you have this, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech and so profane the name of, of your God? I was wondering why that was where it is. <laughs> I mean, I understand why it, why it should be in here, but I don't understand why it should be right here. <clears throat> Was Noah like a fertility god? That I don't know. Pastor Sparling, what kind of god was Molech? I, I know I know how how they offered the sacrifices to Molech. Canaanite god. Pardon? Canaanite. Okay, but but was there was it a fertility god or just a? Oh, yeah, good question. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, let's be says children were offered to God such as one. Yep. Yeah, it was a sacrifice. Yeah. It says here the chief deity of the Amorites. The Amorites. Okay. Uh, Ammonites. Uh, chief deity, I guess that would be the head. The head god, right, right, right. So here we are in the midst of a discussion of improper use of sexual relationships. Where we started last week, we get some of that, this, you know, when 19... What does this have, and, and Gene, this is probably your question, why is this here? In the midst of this discussion of sexual relationships. Well, that interrupts our relationship with God. So okay. The thing about relationships and, and being faithful and how it disrupts the relationship. Especially Moab is... But we're going to get some of that in, in chapter 19. So why doesn't it go in chapter 19? Why here? There is an answer. There is an answer why it, why it is here. It may be due to some sexual connection of some kind. Uh, again, that... Uh, That's why it, it says, why is this here? And, and that was its answer. Okay. Well, and, and, and again, that we would need to know more about this whole worship of Molech. Mm -hmm. what, what, was, because again, 
some of, some of the pagan religions did have sexual uh, disparity w with their worship of their god, but th this one's specifically a child sacrifice. It's driving a knife into the child and killing the child. Um, and and really, this would probably hearken more toward the Jewish people again. Um, with their understanding of family, with their understanding of God. Because we go back to when God gave his promise to Abraham. God's promise to Abraham was to Abraham and to his seed, his children. And so this would then be, you know, would would then fit into then Gene that whole idea of this is an offspring. This this child was born out of a proper sexual relationship that God desired to extend the family, and now you are doing it to disrupt the family. Yeah. So that that's why it fits in here. And, and again. You know, it, it, it seems we go from, from the least to the worst, at least some, in some ways in our eyes, as we see then from their, you know, uh, homosexual uh, relationships, but then bestiality. Uh, again, all of these are disorders of God, you know, we, we dare not signify anyone worse than the other. They're all disorders of the way God designed relationship. And so, you know, and, and, and um, I don't, I know it was, it's been in our readings recently. Um, God, God gives that order of relationship. I am your God, you are my people. And so he desires a, an orderly relationship in order for us as he is holy for us to be holy to receive his holiness among him and so when we disrupt that relationship we disrupt the opportunity to receive his holiness but it's interesting that they talk you know um the first two they mention are unclean the the second two it calls it an abomination and a perversion Anything else there up to 23? Well, it's funny because he's talking about when you've sacrificed a Molech, you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Right. He's talking about the to himself. Right. I am your, I am your God. Why are, why are you seeking... Again, think about... Think about a normal human relationship, you know, between a man and a woman. I am your husband. I am your wife. Why are you seeking another? You know, this is not the way God designed the relationship to be. Um, in that, um, there is so much going on in the world right now that just we're. Half of this stuff is considered normal now, which is crazy. Well, that's crazy to me. Half of it is considered normal? Huh? Half of it can, is considered normal? <laughs> I would say half of it. You know, <laughs> you know the, the Oedipus complex, complex, even in the world, is considered wrong. <clears throat> Because we live in our human nature. Yeah. Um, and we've given ourselves over to another God. Is basically what, what happens. And that and that's all God's trying to do here. He's, he's trying to establish some boundaries for them to say that this is the way to have a normal relationship. First of all, with me, and then second of all, with one another. You know. 
to spend a, a, se a second more on what Forrest brought out. <clears throat> it's not you're, it's not that you're going to profane God. It's that you're profaning His name. And for the, for that, if you'll remember, for them, it's that they have taken His name. They bear His name. Mm -hmm. And you remember the commandment is that you won't bear his name in vain. And so the bearing of God's name is akin to bearing his purpose. Bearing his name is akin to bearing his, his purpose. And so, um, you know, if you bear his name, his name makes you holy. And, um, you know, this is, I don't know, I've talked about this, but the, the, the similarity between th this stuff that we're studying and the, the chapter 15 stuff uh, about all the, the laws about the, the bodily discharges, it's all about the handling of the seed. Right. It's all about the handling of the seed. And since God's put his name on you, then it's assumed that his name is going to be on your seed. And so he has, he has a say in how you handle your seed. And your children are your seed just as much as your semen is your seed. No difference there in terms of what is a seed. Your child is your seed just as much as your bodily discharge. So it's... It, it's a parallel. How often is seed used in the Old Testament? Lots and lots okay. and lots. That's what I thought. Yeah, in fact, I'm pretty sure it's even used in conjunction with the Moloch passage. Okay. Let me check it. And again, you know, to me, that, that bears out when, when he's making this promise to Abraham. You know, um, how important that because it's not just to one person it's to that one person and for all eternity um, so thereby yes you you want to maintain those relationships to to honor and glorify God in his name it is seed by the way it is seed not there. to offer it's your not seed children. to Mola. so it's not children it's offer your seed uh, yeah well it's the, the word seed is the word for offspring <laughs> and so it's, okay. it does double duty gotcha gotcha anything else somebody read 24 to the end of the chapter do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things for by these things the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of these abominations, even the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For the people of the land who were before you did all these abominations so that the land became unclean. Lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean, as it vomited out the nation that was before you. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the persons who did them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge never to practice any of these abominable customs that were practiced before you and never make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Whose land is it? God. <laughs> and he even, he even is telling the people, I'm preparing the land for you. I'm driving out the nation. I'm driving out before you uh, those who have become unclean. Um, but I like the graphic nature, the land, not only is God driving them out, the land is vomiting it, them out. So even the land itself find that, finds them reprehensible. Uh, 
in doing that. And, and, and so, and again, as we've been saying with this, for the, for the Jew, what did, what did they consider the holy place, the place where God dwelt? The holy of holies. Okay, the tabernacle. I think we're getting the, just just like we got the extension of uh, what they said about you know what what meats to eat and how to go about that you know the extension of the banqueting table. I think this is the extension then of God with where He dwells. Is is God confined to just the holy of holies? Oh, didn't they think He was? But I think God is reminding them that I'm not just confined to this place. I am in all of this place. Um, and, and, and thereby al allow yourself to be in relationship with me in all of these places, not just in this one place. Now, is there a significance to that one place? Yes. Yes, there is a significance to that one place, but I think sometimes we fall in the same trap. Where we're, 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 we're godly for an hour on a Sunday morning and really don't. <laughs> you didn't see what's off camera. <laughs> we had one of these. We were off. <laughs> Well, and, and, and again, it, realizing God's presence among us and, and, and what God desires among us and, and, and that which um, he chooses to give us. Um, I'm going to say a little bit more in the next chapter on the phrase, but you shall keep my statutes and my rules and do none of these abominations. But again, I think that's Again, God is establishing a pattern for us, a rhythm for us. God is a God of order. And so here is a nice orderly pattern and rhythm of which to live life sexually. And again, uh, a message that the world needs to hear today. Um, Dan, last week I pointed out some statistics on pornography um, and, and also mentioning that it's not just cultural deviance, it's in the church too. Where did you get uh, what, what kind of stats, like internet volume? Does it, it, it was, Bar Barna had a number of statistics of, uh, of those who are, are um, regular Christians there, uh, the percentage of people that are once a month or regularly um, involved in, and the numbers are pretty, pretty significant. Um, yeah. And, the, and that then becomes that, dis, you know, because again, you can hold this, well, pornography is not in this. Well, yeah, it is. You know, as I mentioned last week, the, the, where it came up was uh, you shall not uncover the nakedness okay. okay. because many of there are some translations that just translate it as sexual intercourse and I'm I was saying no there's a whole bigger span of the uncovering of nakedness in this so yeah, I read all that business about the nakedness as a, as stewardship language is who's who is the steward of this person's nakedness? In other words, who's the steward of their body? And as it turns out, the husband is the steward of the wife's body and the father is the steward of the daughter's body. Um, and we are steward of one another's bodies in that sense. And pornography is a violation of, stu of good stewardship, right. basically. Yeah. Yeah. So is uh, extramarital sex, so is homosexuality. It's, an, it's a violation of, of the stewardship of our bodies, of, of our neighbor's body. Right. Our neighbor's body. <clears throat> and and that, that is really going to be where what gets pointed out in the next chapter. This, this really hit more on family 
stewarding of the family. Right. The next chapter is going to on the neighbor. On the neighbor, we're we're, we're going to see uh, again a broadening. You know, as as we've been, you know, the broadening from the from the 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 sanctuary, the holy of holies, out to you know the rest of the camp. We're 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 seeing we're going to see this broadening of relationships. Eighteen was specifically family, more in the family sense. Um, this gets broadened out in nineteen to say, okay, we have we have a larger extended family. Um, and that, and that, and, and when you start thinking about it, isn't that what happens here? A am I, am I to steward my own household? Yeah. And, and not just as a pastor, but as a member of all saints, Lutheran church, all of us, aren't we supposed to steward this household? And how do we best do that? And that's where, and that's really where chapter nineteen is going. Is the the, the commentator Kleinick Kleinick? I think that who is who wrote it. He talks about the liturgical community. This is our liturgical community. Um, the, those who those who are listening to. The rhythm and the patterns that God has established for us in our life. And so, yes, it begins in our households, but it extends at, well, it begins in our relationship with God. It extends out to our household. Then it, now it extends out into that larger uh, extended family that we, that we see with the household of God. Quick, quick question. Is there a sign for stewardship? Good works. Good works. Good works is the sign for steward. ASL knows what it's doing. Thank <laughs> <laughs> you. That's good. I like that. Yeah. That'll preach. That'll preach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Chapter 19, somebody read 1 through 10. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect his mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make gods of cast metal for yourselves. I am your God. When you sacrifice a fellowship offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that he will be, it will be accepted on your behalf. It shall be eaten on the day you sacrifice it or on the next day. Anything left over until the third day must be burned up. If any of you, any of it is eaten on the third day, it is impure and will not be accepted. Whoever eats it will be held responsible because he has desecrated what is holy to the Lord, that person must be cut off from his people. When you reap the harvest of, your, of the land, do not reap to the very edges of the field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that are falling. Leave it for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Okay. You're going to hear that phrase either in its extended version or its shortened version throughout this chapter. We've already heard it in the last chapter. Uh, you're either going to hear, I am the Lord or I am the Lord your God, multiple times. Uh, and, and again, um, does, it, does, it, does it need to bear repeating? Why? <laughs> to remind us constantly. Go ahead, Forrest. <laughs> I, I, I see words hanging on your lips. <laughs> well, I guess it too. Yeah, it need to be repeated because Israel apparently forgot it once they took over the promise. But I think about myself, sort of like what Paul says when you look, look at yourself in the mirror and then you walk away from what you look like. You know, I have like morning devotions, I, cut, I go to church. Have a relationship with God. How often do I go out into the world and 
get that. I have to constantly remind myself that I have a relationship with God and he's right there with me in whatever I do. So yeah, I think it does have everything, but we're, we're, so, we're so prone to get caught up in our own selves and forget it. And, and again, with what Pastor Sparling was saying, you know, we bear his name. We bear his name. Uh, and, and he starts this chapter off that way, you know, is um, for you shall be holy for I am, I, the Lord, your God am holy. You know, and, and we've said this time and time again is our holiness. What do we do for our holiness? Okay. It's given to us. It's. It's it's that relationship, and and th this this will get into some of my reaction to the the phrase I I mentioned before is uh, you shall keep your statutes and you shall keep my statutes and my rules, especially the way some people have termed that today. It's really borne out on this this sense of where where does our holiness comes come from? Does it come from our obedience? to his rules and statutes. No. Our obedience to his rules and statutes come from the holiness that he's imputed on us. Okay. <clears throat> right. And, and so I, I, I think that's part of the repetition, I am the Lord your God, it is, is that, that sense of he, I am the Holy One of Israel. I think it's really nice. Like that we have this. I haven't really thought about it this way, but those times when you are out there and you've forgotten, and all of a sudden maybe you flip up a world word or you have a, a, a thought that's not in keeping with God, you have those ten commandments, and you go, oh yeah. And so it it, it kind of a reminder and brings you where you need to be. So I think that's that's just a, a loving father that gives. Did you notice that at the very beginning, you know, after he says, uh, you shall be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. What does immediately he do after that when he talks about his holiness? Where, where does he go immediately after that? Respect your mother and your father. Okay, there's a command. What's the, ne what's the next phrase that he says? He says, I'm the Lord. Keep, keep your Sabbaths. Yeah. There's another command. What's the one after that? Do not... Uh, turn to idols and make for yourself any gods. There's another command. I am the Lord your God. There's another command. He immediately goes to the commands. You know, and and, and, and says, okay, here, here is what God's holiness looks like uh, in this. And, and, and really the rest, as I, so to me, the first four verses are really the, um, overview for this whole chapter. This is about, okay, I am the Lord your God, and I'm the Holy One. I, I pour my holiness out upon you. Now, how does it look in your life? How is that lived out? So Gene, you're exactly right. It's, we don't, um, I, got, I gotta get the phrase right. Uh, we don't keep the statutes and the promises to get the holiness. We keep the statutes and the promises out of the holiness mm -hmm. that it is born out. So we live these things out. And so um, with with these with these first two sections here, notice notice it ends with an and I am the Lord your God. That's why we went to all the way uh, through uh, ten. You have two scenarios here. You've got the offering of the sacrifice of uh, peace offerings. And then you have the reaping of the harvest of your land. Both of them are provisions for food. The first scenario of the sacrifice of the peace offering, who is God providing food for? The people. Yeah. Yeah, the people. The people, his people. Yeah. His people. The next one, the second one, when you reap the harvest... Who is he providing food for? The other people, as well as the 
His people what? as well as the sojourners. It, it, it's specifically for the sojourner. So, so yes, he's providing the what the crops, the crops. But, but really the, the, the significant What's point here is What's left? Leave, leave the droppings right. because that I, I'm going to provide for the sojourner in that way. Do you think the people, well, I think the nation of Israel at this time sees God in the tabernacle? At, at and, this, and, at and, this and, time and, or at this time? Yes. <laughs> right answer. Only in the tabernacle. They don't see his presence outside so much because they come to him and that's where he is at just like moses going up on the mountain i don't think they see him like jesus says go I'm, i am with you always in in that presence I, I just don't see that in the nation of israel specifically at that time for sure i may be wrong but i'm just thinking that's God's there, I'm out here. If I'm outside, you know, the, t the tenant area, if I'm outside that community, you know, God's not out there with the ones we've cast out. They have to work their way back in. And I, I can see that in the Pharisee, Pharisaic behavior. Mm -hmm. That's not really borne out like when you read the Psalms and things like that. There's a lot of talk about the glory of God and nature. And, right. So I, I think you're probably right in that there are people that, you know, just like we do today, you, know, we start, you mentioned it earlier, we tend to think of God in the middle of the church and we're all about the glory of God. I just think that's just a tendency in people overall. But I think there were like you know, with Solomon and King David, you know, they, they got it. They knew that the presence of God was everywhere and they knew that he was in that tabernacle. Yeah, my two cents. I <clears throat> I agree with I agree with uh, with Jack um, that the Israelites regarded their deity. They regarded their God as a local presence. Um, when the cloud moved, people moved. They moved, or or their God left them behind, and. Um, <clears throat> And the Holy of Holies was his, was the most localized presence there was. There was a, there was, his presence emanated forth from there, but it emanated forth from a spot on earth. So I think in large part, probably until the ascension, that was the notion of God that you were until the ascension. I think it's the ascension itself that turns that notion upside down. It begins, I would say it begins to turn the notion upside down because I think they probably still were. They probably, yeah, it took, maybe it took a while to set, but. Because yeah. with you saying that, because look at the reaction at the crucifixion when he died. Look at the reaction, and, and we'll hear it Sunday. Look at the reaction of the ones who came and found the empty tomb. There's still, to me, there's still there's maybe no some of that localized. I told, I told, I told wondering for him in a place. Right, right. There's still yeah. that sense of that localized, and and I'm sure. <laughs> well, in 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 Acts, when the ascension happens in Acts one, what what do the angels say to the disciples? What are you looking at? Why are you standing there just staring? Yeah. The, the <laughs> idea of an of an indwelling Holy Spirit is a New Testament as a New Testament specific idea. Yeah. And Jesus began to teach it, but Jesus doesn't doesn't do it until Pentecost. Right. So I think Jack, you're I mean, I would wholeheartedly support your thesis. I mean, I think your thesis is nearly obvious, um, the way I read scripture. <clears throat> Um, not that they're wrong, by the way. They're not wrong about it. It's the way God sets things up. Right, right. These are his blueprints. When he's saying, go out and do this. Go out and live this way. Right. It's like him sending them out from him 
to be an example. Why? And it gets back to what Pastor Sparling said. Why? So they're, they're bearing the name of God wherever they go. They've been set aside. Is, isn't that isn't that what our great commission is about? Except except attached to the promise of the great commission is oh not only is my name attached to you but I will be with you always. So getting back again to you know what you guys have been saying is now we've got this sense of this God who's moving among and with and through us and from us. Um, and so, yeah, this is the way it looks. This is the way it looks in, in, in taking care of, of, of God taking care of people, both his own and for the sojourner, the ones that are not his own. Um, he, he takes care of them. Oh, isn't there something about rain falling upon the... Yeah, yeah. Right, so so God is sovereign over all creation, but he's localized in his presence. He's still sovereign over all creation, but he's localized. He's, his presence is particular. And, and we carry that today, because what, what do we talk about? The, the, the delivery of word and sacrament to us. Mm -hmm. um, that's how he localizes himself for us today. Yeah, I guess we would say wherever his word is properly taught and sacraments are properly administered, administered, that his presence is guaranteed or is promised, is promised there. Um, but, you know, of course, you're right. I mean, to people today, it's like they, they regard, and to what extent are they right? To what extent are they wrong? That I'm going to go you know, meet God on, on, up on Bald Mountain or a Blood Mountain. I'm going to go, that's going to be my worship. I'm going to go up, I'm going to go on a hike and I'm, that's going to be my worship. Like, to what extent are they right? Is God there? Yes. I, I guess so. I think so. But to what end, Gene? I, but I don't think that's proper worship. Right. To, that's, that's my, that's, I guess that's my question. To what end is it, is it, in, it to what end is it even of value that God is there, right? To what end, uh, um, so what? Where isn't He? If you're going to go to the, <laughs> if you're going to go to the mountaintop, well, well why bother going to the mountaintop? Just go to the bathroom. That's right. Are you right here? <laughs> I think it would be <laughs> right. If, in other words, the God is everywhere idea is pretty much worthless. He's everywhere. So what? So don't do anything. Well, Just stay in bed. No, no, no. Wait, why, Gene? Come on. <laughs> Seriously. God, if God is omnipotent and omnipresent. Of course. The Bible says. To what it. end? But to what end? What is that? What good does that do you? It gives me peace and comfort. That's what good it does. Be. Is that proper worship? No, because I'm not coming together with fellow Christians to do it. Okay. And so I think there is a bit, the, the family benefit of worship. Yeah. That is with our Christian family. We need not only, not only do we have God lifting us up, we also have our fellow believers lifting us up. And you don't do that when you're by yourself. It goes back to relationship, just like all this is about relationship. Decided, exactly. I'm going to go worship on the mountain apart from my, my body of uh, believers. You're segregating yourself and you're disrupting the relationship. We were, we were meant in our worship to be a body of believers to support and help you with one another, like Gene's saying. So, yeah, yeah, God's with you on the mountain, and yeah, what good does that do? You know, it's, it's when I get together with my fellow Christians and we're all uplifted, and, and it's it's a wholeness. It's not there when you go off by yourself and worship. God Himself is a relational God. Right. Absolutely. Exactly. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God Himself in His very being is a relational God. And and that's and again that we go back to Genesis two. It is not good for man to be alone. Right. But not only is he a relational God with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he's a relational God with us. Oh, right. 
Right. No. But I'm, I'm saying it starts there. It does. Work. And, and, and oh, yeah. And, and somebody asked me the question, if God, if God knew all this stuff was going to happen, man was going to fall, why do why he create us? Why do he, because he's a relational God. I know who that said. He's a relational God. He, he, des, he desires that. And he still created us because that's, that's a, a moment of grace because he still wanted the relationship. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jack. I see the importance of what's been said, but I also see the importance of whether it be up on the mountaintop, not in the bathroom, I don't think the bathroom, <laughs> but, but I just see times uh, personally that I've gone out and sat on my rocker on the front porch. It's been quiet and peaceful, and I have that alone time with him. I find very beneficial. It's like when Jesus, I'm not comparing myself to Jesus, but Jesus went off by himself and prayed. Yes. Okay, and when I go out on the front porch, I'm out there by myself, and I'm praying, I'm reading my devotion or whatever, that quiet time that I have, yeah, I find that very beneficial. I wouldn't say that that would be the only time that I would need. I would also need time with brothers and sisters, but I think the brothers and sisters also need their quiet time with the Lord. I think it's both beneficial. For what it's worth, the bathroom is the only place I can get quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an animal. I need to go Been through there. a prayer room. <laughs> let me, pro let me pro see, I'm not disagreeing with anything y'all are saying, but I am pro trying to press a different point. Right, right. Um, and let me try and press it in a different way to approach a completely different angle. Sitting next to me, let's say, is a, a an atheist who's never baptized and who's avowed in his atheism, let's say, re totally rejecting of, of Christ. And sitting in here, sitting in my seat, is a baptized believer. Now, according to our doctrine, the Holy Spirit dwells in me, right? Yes. What about him? God is everywhere. No, he's rejected. So, so is that a God-free zone, that person? No? Okay. So there is a difference between saying God is everywhere and saying God localizes himself. There is a difference. Yes. If God is everywhere, surely he hasn't abandoned this lost and condemned creature sitting next to me. Right? But God has localized himself in me. And that's the difference between the mountaintop and the sanctuary. There's a, pro there's a particular promise, a, a particular promise that, that is uh, as biblical as a particular promise. I, you know, he, the, his, his promised presence, let's say, is in, with, and under the bread and wine. That's a promised presence. Um, that's, that carries different weight than, you know, than yeah. the glory that we all acknowledge we experience when we, you know, when we're in the mountains or what have you. There's, it's not that he's not there. It's that functionally his presence for this guy over here um, is, of, is, let's just say, very, very, very different. And... Than his, than his dwelling in the, the body, the life, the heart, the soul, the mind of a, of, a, of a baptized believer. Or, as Gene says, in the commute within the community. Right? Well, it does, because it isn't just where three or more are gathered in the That's area. right, right, it, it, right. So, there, so then, I, you know, you could take it to the, to the next level. I mean, you go to your rotary meeting. Is God there? Of course he is, but in a very, very, very different way than God is present in your worship service. Or even right here. Or even right here, and we're not even worshiping. So that, that's kind of the point I'm driving, and, 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 and really it's your fault, Jack, because you brought it up. <laughs> so much but the point point that you brought up, Jack, is just crucial. Crucial, and it's reflect. This is what God means. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. 
Not you shall be holy because the tabernacle is holy or because these laws are holy or because, you know, the land is holy. It's I. I am holy. I, the Lord your God. In fact, you, could you make the argument? I could make the argument. Why am I asking you? <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, chapter 19, verse 2 is the theme verse of Leviticus. The theme verse. If you're not going to grab chapter 10, verse 3 as your theme verse, grab 19, 2 as your theme verse. And he's, he's already mentioned it, this phrase in Leviticus. I yeah, well, and then it's coming up a bunch of, a bunch of times all oh, the way in yeah. these chapters. Right. And I've got them all underlined. An interesting thing, and this comes out of Kleinig, it, and, and since we're on this one, is that you shall be holy for I am. The Lord your God am holy. Is that a fact, a promise, or a command? Yes. <laughs> you got them trained as Lutherans too well. <laughs> you know how long it took to you get. You can't to... fool Lutherans <laughs> like that anymore. You know how long it took to get to that to get point. To that answer? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Because they always say that's a Pastor Dave question. Mm -hmm. How so, Jack? It is a command. No, I, all, you said all of them. Fact, promise, command. It is a fact. It's it's unreasonable. Give give me some give me some it's words. Un, un, unfold that. Because that's who God is. How is it a fact? Mm -hmm. How is you shall be holy a fact? That's what about our faith? Next to it's li it's living out your faith and accepting what God's word says to you. He set me aside. He set the, in this instance, he set the nation of Israel aside. Keep pushing. Okay. And keep going. So we, we've, we've already mentioned about you shall be holy is a fact. Why? What makes you holy? God makes me holy. His spirit living within me. He has given the, his holiness the, to you. The, the resurrection gives me that. Yeah. Um, I should say the death and resurrection. Of your own, you are not holy. Right. No, not on my own. It's all through the be, Because of Because of your baptism, you are holy. God, God has placed his holiness. That is a fact. Oh, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who Something lives. like that. <laughs> your head won nothing. <laughs> how, 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 how is it a promise? How is it a promise? Just, just structurally, it's a promise. You shall be holy. That's a promise. Is it? Structurally, grammatically, it's a promise. It's a promise. But how, how, is it, how is it a promise? You shall be holy. We know it's a fact. It's, it's ours right now because it's of ours. baptism. He, he gives us his holiness. So, so how is that a promise? Because of all he's done for us. I mean, it's, it's what he's done. It's what he, it's a, a promise is a future thing. I understand that. It's a promise because of all I'm doing to, to, uh, to cast that fact in doubt. Yeah. All, all I'm doing <laughs> that's why it's a promise. All it's I'm a fact, it's a, it but the, the reason it's a promise is because I do all kinds of things to cast doubt on that fact so it better be a promise as well right yeah. right I, I'm, I'm going to do enough things that it, it should be taken away from me mm -hmm. but 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 go back again to what you said but because he has said so i don't need to fear it being taken away right yeah and so how is it a command <laughs> <laughs> it's a direct command you will do this. You will be that. It is the way it is. Because I'm holy. It's it's in your mind. Yeah. So be holy. Yeah. It's like my father saying to me, "You will be a mass of error. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? No, no. You're right. It's it, you're right. It's who you are. It's who you are. And, and again, that's who we are as baptized children of God. This is who we are. We, we are this. It, it's, and I've preached this before. It's, it, it's, it's not that we have to. We get to. Now, by the way, class, 
there were the three uses of the law. For those who are unfamiliar with that language, the, the, the three uses of the law, there they are. The fact, the command, and the promise. And Luther said what? Mirror, curb, and rule. Rule. Mirror, curb, and rule. Um, those are the three uses of the law, and they, they all, they're all contained. The, the, the grammar, by the way, is ambiguous enough to contain all three uses. In other words, it, the grammar isn't, we're, we're not stretching the grammar to fit those three uses in. The grammar is ambiguous enough that it functions all three ways. Because why I like, when I do my translations of the Ten Commandments, I like, so for instance, um, uh, uh, you'll have no, I like to, to, to translate, you'll have no other gods before me. I like that because it, it, in English, it adopts that ambiguity. You'll have no other gods, but well, what are you telling me? Are you telling me I shouldn't? Are you telling me I won't? Or are you telling me I ought not? <laughs> uh, yes, all three, you know? And so, <laughs> and I like that. I like English. When they, when they mailed out the, the new catechism eight years ago or whatever, and they asked us for our feedback, that, I wrote 12 pages on this one verb and sent it in to them, and they didn't take my advice. <laughs> but... It's the, and I wrote, I wrote a bunch of more pages on one other thing, but that's another story for another day. But, um, but to me, the, the, the translation, you'll have, you'll have, you, sure, you could, you could de con, what is it, contract? Con, con, construct. Con, no, no, uh, the con, oh, contraction. contraction. Oh. You can decontract the word you'll, but I don't want to. I want the contract, the, yeah, you want the contraction. Contraction. I want the contraction. You want the contraction. Because the contraction creates the ambiguity that is in the Hebrew grammar. You'll have no other gods before me. Well, that's true in all three ways. So, I don't know. I, I like it in English better than you shall not or, you know, you will not. All of those are less ambiguous, and in my opinion, than less faithful translations. Can I say it that way? You'll have, you'll well, be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. There's no ambiguity on I, the Lord your God, am holy. But there's ambiguity, not ambiguity in whether or not you'll be holy. It's whether it's a promise, a command, or a thing. It, it's an, it, it, it's, it's, it's the, you know, in our Lutheran tradition, we have so many paradoxes. The paradox is there to create the tension to keep things in their place. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I usually explain it in catechism class, I, when I was a kid, I, I used to, I loved to play with magnets. And, and, and when, when, you, when you would hold the magnets like poles, what happens when you, when you hold the like poles of magnets? They push, apart. they push apart. So I would sit there playing with them to see how close I could get them together before they pushed apart. And but will will they ever come together? No, they will never come together. And and that's what happens in our Lutheran theology. We've got these paradoxes that we 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 work at pushing them together, but they never will come together. So we don't need to, you know, it's, it's that same sense as we don't need to resolve this thing. You know, let let all three stand and understand how they stand and and and, and cherish that. Um, yeah, you know, um, we're going to celebrate Holy Communion on Thursday night. Bread and wine. Body and blood. Yes. Explain that one. There are people who want to push them together. Will they ever come together? Not, not in our sense. So, so we we let them stand. Let them stand as they are. Yeah. That's where we're gonna stop.
let's close with a word of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, what you give to us. And you give us just a, a, an outlay uh, of orderliness in, in which we can uh, relate with you, but relate with one another uh, in our household, in our congregation, but also in our community. And so as we continue this process, let us see how you have given us your name you have uh, imbued us with your holiness and so how can we live that out so that others may see you through us guide us and lead us in those endeavors in jesus name we pray amen, amen.